All right, here we go. Today we have one of the greatest baseball players of all time. Pete Rose, a.k.a. Charlie Hustle, a.k.a. the Hit King, the all-time MLB leader in hits, three-time World Series champion, MVP winner, Rookie of the Year, and countless other accolades. Pete Rose, it's truly an honor to sit down with you today. Well, thank you very much, and uh, go ahead. Mention the other accolades we got all day. Just kidding. <laughs> we'll get Just, to kidding. Just kidding. We'll get, we'll get, there's a lot of other accolades that I'm going to get to. But it's our first time sitting down together. So I want to start in the very beginning. So born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio. I was born in Cincinnati. I was born actually about three miles from uh, Crawley Field, where I broke in with right. the Reds in 1963. So I, needless to say, I'm a hometown boy. That's right. Now, your dad... Uh, actually played semi-pro football until he was like almost 50 years old. Actually, he's 44. And uh, I got to see him play because, uh, uh, you know, back in the 50s, I was the water boy for the football team. I was the ball boy for his basketball team. And I was the bat boy for his baseball team. So I was always going to some kind of sporting event to watch my uh, father participate. It was fun. It was all part of growing up. Okay, so clearly you grew up in a very sports-oriented family. And you yourself, you started playing baseball at age eight? Uh, literally baseball. Probably I started switch batting when I was nine. So probably eight is, is correct. Eight or nine, something like that. Okay, now you were a switch batter from the very beginning. Are you right-handed or left-handed? Naturally right-handed, but uh, I become a switch batter when I was nine years old. Not okay. a switch hitter. I mean, that's that's Not relatively rare. Hitter. I was a switch batter. Let's clarify switch that batter. right now, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's not very common. Uh, why was it that at such a young age you started being able to, you know, to bat from both directions like that? Well, I, I think what happened to me is uh, I had an uncle uh, who was a scout for the Reds and was a great ball player. And he, he didn't become the ball player that he became until he became a switch batter. So my dad and him got their heads together, and I showed some potential uh, to be a switch batter. And uh, I remember my dad telling the coach, I don't care what the situation is. If there's a right-hander pitching, I want him to bat left-handed and vice versa. And that was at the age nine. So that's when I uh, started hitting from both sides of the plate. Big advantage. Okay. It was a big advantage when I played, being a switch batter, because you always got that breaking ball, curveball, slider, and those type of pitches coming into you, as opposed to going away it, from you. Yeah, I, I bet. Okay, so you start playing I used baseball to at it. I used to bet, too. You just said you bet? No. You just said that. I bet. Oh, okay. no, I don't. Yeah, I said I bet. Right. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I bet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you start playing baseball at age eight, but wasn't football like your your real first love? Yeah, uh, it's because my dad was a great football player, and uh, I don't think my the, the game of football was my first love at eight or nine years old. Uh, that didn't happen till fourteen or fifteen when I got to high school. Uh, but I really li I really liked football, uh, and I was a real good football player. I just didn't, my mistake, I didn't like, I didn't like school. You know, I almost went to the University of Tennessee to play football, but uh, hey, when I graduated from high school, I weighed 158, and two years later playing baseball, I weighed 202. So I, I matured physically late as an athlete. Well, let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. So you're playing football at Western Hills High School. Yes. And um, you were kind of small back then, yes. right? Yes, yes. Now, yeah, I grew. Your I freshman year, in my second sophomore year, that's when I started right. filling out, uh, because no one right. in my family was ever real small. Uh, all the males in my family were 190, 195, 200, something like that. So uh, everybody knew. I guess they didn't know when, but they knew I was going to grow eventually, because they mm -hmm. used to call me Little Pete all the time, because my dad's <laughs> name was Pete. Pete. Yeah, I was a little Pete. You were a little Pete, big yeah. Pete. Okay, so you start out your freshman year um, as a running back, but um, you weren't promoted to varsity your sophomore year. Right. And that became a problem for you? No. Uh, school became a problem for me. And, and, and I flunked my, my first sophomore year. 
So then I played football my second sophomore year and my junior year. And by the time I was a senior, I already had the, uh, the six, semesters of, six semesters of eligibility. So I didn't play any sports when I was a senior in high school. Right. Okay. So from what I understand is because, you know, you weren't really focused on school. Right. You actually had to attend summer school or be held back a year. And if you attend a summer school, you wouldn't get to play, you know, sports over the summer. So your dad decided to actually hold you back so you could play in the summer. No, I, I never, I never went to summer school in my life. Uh, you know, I screwed around my first sophomore year and uh, I flunked. So now I woke up from my second sophomore year uh, and in my junior year, then the senior year, I was ineligible because I already had the six semesters of eligibility under my belt. Exactly. Okay. So you were what, like 19 by the time you were a senior? I was 19 when I graduated. Got it. Okay. So. But don't forget, I didn't play as a school. senior. I never played any exactly. sports as a senior. Matter of fact, when I was a senior, uh, I played in the Dayton AA Amateur League, Dayton, Ohio, which was a real good league, twice a week, Wednesdays and Sundays. And I'll never forget, I was 25 for 50 in that league. And that's when I signed with the Reds out of that Dayton AA Amateur League. Okay, because you had an uncle named Buddy. He was a scout for the Reds. He was, exactly. He was a bird dog scout for the Reds. And from what I understand, I mean, the Reds weren't trying to get you at the time. No. He convinced them to, to bring you on? My uncle did. Um, exactly. I think what my uncle did, uh, he convinced them that everybody in my family matured physically late. Uh, he, he convinced them I was going to weigh more than 155 pounds. Because back in the 60s, they weren't knocking the doors down to sign 150 pound second baseman that just started switch hitting five or six years before. So it worked. He got, he, he, he got me a, uh, an opportunity to play, um, professional baseball. I signed on Friday, left on a Saturday to go to Geneva, New York to play in the New York uh, pin league. And I'll never forget when I got there, I'm two days out of high school. And the second baseman, you know, the season already had started because this is June. And uh, when I got to the ballpark the next day, the second baseman on that team was a guy named Antanasio Perez, Tony Perez. He was two months out of Cuba. So I've been friends with Tony Perez since June of 1960. Mm. Think about that. Yeah. Okay, so if we're talking about 1963, how rare was it for a kid coming straight out of high school to join the MLB? Because you didn't do any college at all. No. No, we didn't have... Back in them days, we didn't have time to go to college. Uh, you had to put your apprenticeship in the minor leagues. And I was relatively fast. Uh, I only spent two years and two months uh, in the minor leagues. But don't forget, after my, my first two months with Geneva, then I went to Tampa the next year to play in the uh, Florida State League, and I hit 330 and was player of the year. Then the next year, I went to Macon, Georgia, which is a, was in the Sally League, and I hit 330 again and kind of paved the way for me to go to spring training as a non-roster player for the 63 season. Hey, and I end up impressing the manager, who was Fred Hutchison, and he added me to the team. Well, right. I guess during that game against the Chicago White Sox in 63, uh, the regular second baseman, uh, Don Blasting game. game. Yeah. Blasting game. He pulled a groin muscle. Hey, so he, he missed they, a couple of days and, uh, uh, and I played the next 24 years. Right. You took full advantage of that and you kind of just went into that position. Sounds like Wally Pipp, doesn't it? Yep. Yep. Don't, hey, if you got a okay, job, so, man, if you got a job at the big league level, don't ever give it up, especially for an injury. Yep. And uh, right. you know, I missed, I missed ten games in the nineteen seventies, which is eleven years in the big leagues. I missed ten games, and three of them was because I got hurt uh, running into Ray Fossey in the nineteen seventy uh, All Star game. 
That was three of the 10 that I missed in the 70s. That's pretty consistent. Oh, no, you have an incredible track record of making it to almost every game. I mean, yeah, it's insane. Now, there's a couple of different, different versions of this. So the name Charlie Hustle, how did you get that nickname? Okay, here's my take on it. In spring training, 1963, we're playing in Fort Lauderdale. We're, we're training in Tampa. The Yankees train in Fort Lauderdale. And I, I'm a non-rostered player just sitting on the bench, and all of a sudden they needed a pinch runner in the eighth inning. Okay, because I have, haven't went out to do my running yet and call it a day, I had to wait for the bus to go all the way back to the area coast to Tampa. And um, the manager said, Pete, go in and pinch run for so-and-so. And I did, and I, I, I tagged up on a short fly ball down the left field line and went to second, safe. Now, I'm on second, and the guy got a... Uh, a base hit and a short pop up to the shortstop, Tony Kubek, who was backpedaling. And when I played, no one's going to be backpedaling to throw me out. Okay, so he caught it and I tagged up from third and went in the home head first. And we won the game three to two. And I was on the start of the game show. And after the game, as, as happened in those days, the reporters all went in the clubhouse to interview the players. And this one particular group of uh, writers was talking to Mickey Mantle and Whitey Ford. And one of them, I don't know which one said it, but one of them said, did you see that that Charlie Hustle beat, beat you tonight by tagging up from third? And I don't know if Mickey said that to Whitey or Whitey said that uh, to Mickey. But then the next day in the paper, the headline, Charlie Hustle beats Yanks. That's <laughs> how I got that name. And it's stuck ever since. Stuck ever since. I don't know what would happen if they'd have called me Charlie Two Shoes or something, but Charlie Hustle <laughs> was the name that they gave me. And I was, okay. I was happy because in those days, I'm a young kid, 20 years old or so, and I get to go to Fort Lauderdale to play the Yankees. I get to play against Mickey Mantle, Yogi Berra, you know, uh, Whitey Ford, people like that. So, that was like a dream come true to me. Okay, so then April 8th, 1963, you guys had a game against the Pittsburgh Pirates. Bob Friend was. That's when you made your major league debut. Yeah. How did it feel to walk out, you know, walk on that field well, for the first time? Well, it was goosebumpy, and, and I wasn't really nervous until right before, don't forget, we were from Cincinnati. Right before the game, the press got my mom and dad from behind the dugout to come down on the field to get pictures of me because I was leading off for the Reds that day. And that kind of woke me up uh, that I'm playing for the Cincinnati Reds on opening day, something I wanted to do my whole life. And uh, my mom and dad were part of it because they were right there on the field with me. Uh, Bob Friend was pitching. First time up, I walked on four pitches. I don't know if I could have swung. I was so nervous. But then the next guy up was Frank Robinson, who hit a home run. So I scored the first run uh, of the year that year because in those days, the Reds were the only team to play on that Monday before opening day. Everyone else played on Tuesday, but the Reds got the opening day on Monday because that was... Uh, the first professional team in the history of baseball, the Cincinnati Red Stockings, 1869. Mm. Well, originally, when you first started playing, you went 0 for 11. Yeah. But I hit the ball hard, though. I was hitting the ball hard. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't remember why I went 0 for 11, because if you're a rookie and you're playing in the big leagues, and you play three or four games, you don't get a hit. They usually send your ass back to the minors. But then I, I got a couple hits and uh, uh, end up the, the manager liked me. Freddie Hutchinson liked me. And uh, it was a real quickish team in those days. I didn't fit in because they had guys who 61 went to the World Series. 62 had kind of an off year. Now 63, they think they're going to come back and get to the World Series and they stick this young 
brash rookie from Cincinnati uh, at second base and, and, and hitting him first in the lineup. So uh, I had a tough battle, but I didn't realize it. I didn't give a damn. I was happy to be in the big leagues. I didn't care what other people thought the way I played, the way I hustled, the way I slid, the way I run the first on a base on balls, the way I was always early and left late. Uh, that's just the way I was. Well, you got your first major hit, major league hit on April 13th. Yeah. And then you finished off the year with a 273. Right. And you won rookie of the year that year. Yes. I beat out uh, Ron Hunt. Ron Hunt. From the Mets. Uh, I scored over 100 runs, which was a good stat for hitting 273. But in those days, 273 was respectable, especially if you're a young kid with only two years of minor league experience facing those big league pitchers every day. But I did get some doubles and, and, and walks and stuff like that. And, and when you score 100 runs as a rookie, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good stat. 101, I think, actually. But I had Frank I mean, how Robinson, did you feel? I had Frank Robinson coming up after me. Frank Robinson, mm -hmm. Aveda Pinson, and Darren Johnson. That was our uh, three, four, and five hitter. Hitters. I mean, how did it feel your first year in the major leagues to get rookie of the year? Uh, I remember that too. Uh, matter of fact, I remember everything. I was waxing the floor when I got a call from Jack Lang from Sports Writers of America, because I was in the Army. I was waxing the, the, the mess hall floor at Fort Knox, Kentucky, when I got the call that I was named Rookie of the Year. That was pretty interesting, too. See, because after the season, instead of having to join for a couple years, I went to uh, active duty for six months, then I was in the reserves for six years. But I was waxing the mess hall floor at Fort Knox when Jack Lang called the office there at the, at the, uh, at the uh, military base and told me I was Rookie of the Year. Wow. So you were the most famous soldier <laughs> on that whole. At that time. <laughs> for, at that time. I was. At that time. Exactly. Okay. I was, so, still, I was still a PFC, though. Yeah. Okay, so that next year, 1964. Yeah. You you play again, but this time you didn't have such a great year. Um, you fi finished with a 269 average, but you got benched during the course of the year. Yeah. And that's when you decided to go to Venezuela. You're absolutely right, uh, for two reasons. One, because you made money. Okay, don't forget when I was in the big leagues the year before, my salary was 7000 a year. 7,000. I got more than that in my pocket today. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, I had to make, go to Venezuela. To, it was a good league because there was good pitching, a lot of major leaguers uh, playing in the Venezuelan uh, Winter League. And I caught fire. And uh, what I hit, 350, something like that in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And I become a, a, a a crowd favorite the way because I went down there to be honest with you a lot of players go down there and just make the money uh, I went down there and bust my ass I played as hard as I could play for the Venezuelan people and they loved me they got in my camp and that 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 kind of made me take off as a big league hitter because in 65 is the first year I hit 300 that was coming back from Venezuela and I hit 300 like 9, 10, 11 years in a row after I come back from Venezuela. So I guess what I'm saying in a roundabout way is I really learned how to hit in Venezuela. I owe a lot to well, Venezuela. Right. Uh, right, because like you said, when you came back in 65, you actually led the league in hits with 209 hits. And hit 312 or 313, something like that. Um, it, was, it was 312, 312, which was the first of nine consecutive seasons where you were over 300. Yeah, and a couple of three of them seasons were batting championships, 68, mm -hmm. 69, and 73. Yep, yep. Okay, and you're also first at at-bats with 670 that year. Yeah. Well, I didn't walk okay, like so I you did. You know, I, I don't remember, did I walk 100 times my first year? 
I had to do I'm something sure. hit 273 because I scored 101 runs. Uh, and you got to get on base to score runs. Uh, but there again, I was in a good streak in the 60s as far as hitting hitting the baseball and getting a lot of hits. And like I told you a minute ago, uh, I was always healthy. You know, I, I only had two major injuries in my life. 67, I separated my shoulder in Dodger Stadium. In 68, I broke my thumb diving for a ball in Dodger Stadium. Those are the, really the only two injuries I ever had in my life. Unless you want, well, to, call, unless is, you want to call a divorce an injury. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, right, because in 64, you got married. Right. Uh, and you had two kids. You ended up getting divorced later on in 1980. And was it over a baby that you had outside the marriage? I don't remember that. I don't remember okay. that. Uh, I don't think it was, but it, it, may, it may have been. Okay. All right. So you come back strong. Yeah. And then in 66, you hit 16 home runs, which is a career high for you. Yeah. Uh, how did it feel to hit that many home runs that year? Well, it, it, it didn't... It, 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 it didn't mean anything to me because I was never uh, believed I was a home run hitter. I was going to hit a lot of home runs just the way I swang. I didn't swing up. I swung down, hit the ball on the line. But that's, that's about the period of time when I used to set goals every year, hit 300, get 200 hits, and score 100 runs. That's the way I was going to make a living. That's the way I was going to be able to negotiate the next year's contract. Because don't forget, I know you know this because you know everything. My first 16 years with Cincinnati, I signed one-year contracts. I didn't get a multi-year contract until I went to Philadelphia for the 1979 season. So when you're, when you're, when you're playing on one-year contracts, you got to bust your ass to get statistics. Because... That's what negotiating a contract is all about. Stats. Stats. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even about where we finished in the standings. It was about stats individually. Everyone was on their own in the offseason to negotiate a new contract. I mean, was that like that for everybody? Were, were any of your... You yeah, know, I didn't know anybody had a multi-year contract. Frank Robinson, Veda uh -huh. Pinson, Darren Johnson, Gordy Coleman... I didn't know anybody had multi-year. They just didn't have multi-year contracts in those days because free agency wasn't a big deal like it is today. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that same year, you actually switched from second base to right field. Yeah. Well, I, uh, you sure about that? that? You, I, you sure I didn't go from second base to left field, then to right field, then periodically in center field, then back to left field, then to third base, then to first base? So I could play all the positions and I made room for Tommy Helms, you know, who was rookie of the year in 66. Uh, and he was a shortstop, played with me in the minors. But because I moved to third, gave him a chance to play second for the Reds when he won rookie of the year in 66. Uh, I gave Tommy Harper a chance to play in the outfield and I went to third base. Because they knew I could play all over the field. And they, they knew whatever position I played, I would work my ass off to be a decent de uh, defensive player. So if you, you want to be honest, if I want to be honest with you, I think when I was in Philadelphia, I never got the credit, but I think I was a hell of a first baseman. I played my ass off at first base in Philadelphia. You know, but I had Schmidt and Bo and those guys throwing to me in trio. So I had really good infielders. Because I used to think that the, 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 if you got a good player, you don't. You got a bad defensive player. The last place you want to put him is first base, because that's, that's where right. all your outs are. You understand what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. I, I just worked really hard, and I really enjoyed first base. You know, I enjoyed them all, but first base was so much more fun than the other positions, because every time the ball was hit, you got a chance to touch the ball, mm -hmm. and it was no difference with me. And I got Schmidt throwing it right there and Boa throwing it right there and Trio throwing it right there. and uh, It was a lot of fun for me. And we went to the World Series in 80. We went to the World Series in 83. We went to the, the playoffs in 82. So I was helping the team. 
That's all you play defense for is to help the team. Mm -hmm. If they asked me to catch, I'd have caught. Because all through Little <laughs> League, I was a catcher. I was a oh, catcher okay. all through Didn't Little Leagues. Okay. That's that's why I wasn't a fielder in the minor leagues that I ended up being at first base because I was always a catcher until my sophomore Ooh. year of high school. And they put me at second base because I was too small. <laughs> Okay, so 68 rolls around, and 68? you start out with a 68. Okay. Yep. You start out with a 22-game hitting streak. I had seven of those. Yeah. I had seven 20-game or more hitting streaks. Right. But that was your first I one. bet you didn't know that. I didn't know that. You know it now. I know it now. <laughs> but this is your very first one. So how did it feel to go on a streak like that? Well... To be honest with you, I try to get a hit every freaking time up, every game I played. And, you know, I'm one of these guys that uh, I believe someday someone will break 56 in a row. You know, I did 44 one time in 78 and went mm -hmm. over it and I went five or six more. And I couldn't run like some of these guys. I could hit. Uh, so I, I could foresee uh, someone getting on a streak today and maybe, maybe hitting 57 in a row. You have to be a pretty good hitter, and you have to have a lot of luck. Mm -hmm. Even the day that my 44-game hitting streak ended, I hit, I hit two ropes in that game. One right here that Horner caught for an out, and McWilliams was a left-hander, threw a pitch like that, and I hit a one-hopper in his glove, which definitely would have been up the middle to extend the streak. And I was 0 for 4. And I'll tell you one guy was rooting for me in that hitting streak. And his name is Ted Turner. Why? He owned the Atlanta Braves. And the night my streak was broke, they had 40,000 walk-up ticket sales. And if I'd have got to hit that game, they'd have had 40,000 more the next night. Because in those days, the Braves were drawing 12, 14,000 a game. Now, all of a sudden, Mr. Turner's got 40-some thousand at the ballpark. I'm surprised he didn't send me a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> he was a great guy. Ted Turner was a great guy. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay, so then 69 rolls around, and you bat 348, which is a career high for you. So you were absolutely on fire that year. Well, I just, you know, like I said, uh, when I got back from Venezuela, uh, my confidence level changed. You know, I, I felt like I belonged as a big league hitter. And I knew I was on a good offensive team. And I knew I had good offensive players behind me. You know, in those days, with Frank Robinson, Veda Pinson, uh, Darren Johnson, uh, people like that, we, we scored a lot of runs. And I'm the leadoff hitter, so I'm going to score a lot of runs. And my job was just to get base hits. See how many hits I could get every night, every year, every month. And... Uh, that become kind of my calling card, getting 200 hits, scoring 100 runs, getting 40 or more doubles. Those are all things that I tried to do every year I, I played as a player. It's okay to set, I could have set 175 in hits and 85 runs to score, but I set high goals. The only reason you reach your goals is if you set high goals. That's, how, that's the only reason you reach goals. You got to set them who was a lot of people think are too high. I don't know if anybody else ever set goals of 200 hits. I don't know if anybody else ever set goals of 100 runs scored or more. They had 121 year, 131 year. But when you're on an offensive team, you can set high goals. And I wasn't, I wasn't the type of guy who was going to miss any games because of injuries. I'd get 200 hits well, if I was playing today. I'd score 100 runs if I was playing today. I hit 300 mm -hmm. if I was playing a day. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Hell, I played some. I, I, I played against, let me give you a list of guys I faced in my career. Warren Spahn, okay? Sandy Koufax, Don Drysdale, Don Sutton, Juan Marichal, Bob Gibson. I mean, those are all, those are all really good pitchers that I faced over my career. And I didn't take off every time. Hell, we used to have a nine-game road trip. Listen to this. 
We play a Sunday game in Cincinnati, get on the plane and go to L.A. The next three games, we face Koufax, Drysdale, and Sutton. Then we go to San Francisco and face Marichal and Gaylord Perry and someone else. Then we stop in St. Louis on the way home and face Gibson, Carlton, and someone else. So there's nine games during the schedule. I'm facing seven Hall of Fame pitchers. So needless to say, that was a tough-ass road trip. (laughs) <laughs> right, <laughs> but you had a face who's on the schedule you can't pick the easy mm-hmm. ones because I couldn't hit Randy Jones with a boat oar and he, <laughs> you could hit him he was he won a Cy Young by the way but I just couldn't hit Randy Jones and he was the type of guy I love Randy he's the type of guy he's one of those guys that he gets you out and when you run by the mound he'd laugh at you you hate those type of guys I'll get you, you son of a bitch. But he's laughing at me now because he just got me out. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that same year, you also slugged 512, which is the highest by far in your whole career. You also had a 432 OBP, which is a career best. So that was a shotgun year for you. Well, I, we didn't worry about that kind of stuff back in them days. All we worried about was runs. Mm-hmm. Not getting runs or score runs. You got to do one or the other if you're a baseball player. What I mean by that, if you're a success, successful baseball player, you either got to knock in 100 or score 100. If you can do both, God bless you. But I never knocked in 100. I had 81 or 82 a couple of years, which is a lot of RBIs for a leadoff hitter, to say the least. Uh, but I always scored 100. I scored 2,165 runs, which is second all-time to Ricky Henderson. Mm-hmm. That's why you play the game, right? To score more runs in the opposition. That's right. the way I played the game. I never, I never okay. get tired of shaking hands at home plate with teammates. That's yeah. something you never wanted to get old. That means you scored a run. There you go. Okay, so the 1970. The All-Star game. Yeah. Tell me what happened there. Well, we won the game. Uh, let me tell you what happened before the game, which is more interesting than talking about me knocking Fossey on his butt, okay? The night, I had a friend of mine named Sam McDowell. Remember that name? Pitched for Cleveland Indians. Big left-hander, uh-huh. threw hard. He made the all-star team, and I was his friend. And the game was in Cincinnati. He called me the day before the game, and said, we got this rookie player named Ray Fossey who was added to the All-Star game. Can he go out to eat with us? Because I already made dinner reservations for Sam and me. And he brought Ray along with him. So I took Fossey out the night before that game. And I picked up the check, and I knocked him on his ass, and we won the game. That's the only thing that's important. If we right. now listen, if we were playing today, I know you probably got found uh, uh, clips of that. If we were playing today, I'd have been automatically called safe because he had the ball and he was blocking the plate, and you're not allowed to do that today. But I hit him so hard because what had happened, I think, is the ball was about from here, uh, from here to the glove when I hit him. So he's concentrating on catching the ball, and it just had, happened to hit him at the right time. And if you watch the, the clip, I bent over and asked him, was he okay? Okay, because the game was over. We won the game in extra mm-hmm. innings. So a lot of people don't understand that he was a friend of mine that I took out to dinner the night before the game. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Well, yeah. I think it and, is. Uh... I mean, it seemed like you had the bigger injury because you missed three games. Oh, I missed three right? games because of my knee. Yeah. Because of my knee hit his shoulder. He didn't miss any games, mm-hmm. but I got all the criticism. Why? Because I played the game the way you're supposed to play the game. All out, all the time. Sometimes you get criticized. I didn't give a damn because the only people who criticized me were the American League fans. <laughs> It's the truth. Well, yeah. Well, we played, listen, I played in 17 All-Star games. Mm -hmm. And we won 16 of them. The only one we lost was 1971 
when Reggie Jackson hit that ball off of Doc Ellis to hit the pavilion on top of Detroit's uh, Briggs Stadium. I've never seen a ball hit that hard. That's the only game we lost in my 17 All-Star game career. Because when you're in a clubhouse with Aaron and Mays and Clemente and people like that, we took the game seriously. We wanted to prove to America or to the world that the National League was superior to the American League, which we were at that time. We were at that time. And I'll tell you why. One reason and one reason only. Think about this. We had all the African-American players. And when you have the African-American players, what do you create? Speed. We had speed. Willie Mays could run. Hank Aaron could run. Clemente could run. Willie Davis could run. Tommy Davis could run. Cleon Jones could run. We just had better players than the America League. They had good players. Yes, Grimsby was good. K-Line was good. Okay. Babe Ruth was the greatest. Ty Cobb was the greatest. But the National League in the 60s and 70s had better athletes than the America League. I believe. That's my own personal opinion. What do you believe? No, I mean, I agree with you. I agree with you. I mean, statistically, black players, you know, are somewhat faster. It just is what it is. I mean, you could say it's racist or whatever else, but if you look well, at the stats, I, the stats, I was the never stats. a race. I was never a racist of any kind. I just knew that all the teammates I had could run. They could play mm-hmm. outfield. It was harder to hit. They covered more space. If you got mm-hmm. three outfielders and they, they they can all run. There's less holes in left center and right center than if you got a center fielder who can't run or a left fielder who can't run. That's just common sense. I mean, do you think during that time, the early seventies? There was some degree of racism in the MLB? Not as far as I was concerned. Matter of fact, well, there might have been in, in, in baseball in general, because yeah. I remember, I forgot what year it was. Uh, I'm just a kid, and I got called in the Cincinnati Reds office, and they told me I was hanging with the black players too much. That's a fact. Wow. And the reason I hung around with them, because they treated me like I was one of them. I'm talking about Frank and Veda and Jesse Gonder and Tommy Harper. Those were all my teammates, and they were all black. But I would go out to eat with them on the road because it seemed like I was too naive to even understand it. The white players didn't want to associate with me because I was arrogant. Mm. I was cocky. I was a local kid, Cincinnati kid. But Frank and Veda and those guys saw something that other players didn't see. And it, Frank would always take me out on the road to eat because you know I'm making 7000 a year. And he was the best, if not the best player in the league at the time. And uh, I, wouldn't, I, I didn't look at it. I was hanging out with black players. I was hanging out with teammates. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I've never, I never had a racist bone in my body till this day. Some of my best friends are African American. I grew up with African Americans. Mm-hmm. Used to rob stores and banks with them. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how did the name "The Big Red Machine" come together? Um. Well, first of all, uh, in 69, we had a really good offensive uh, team. And Dave Bristol was the manager. Okay, he was the manager of the, of the, the Reds in the 69 season. 68, 67, we were a great offensive team. It may, may have been because I started hitting 300 and Frank was there and Veda was there and Darren was there. Um, in 70, Sparky took over. So here's what I'm saying. Dave Bristol assembled the Big Red Machine, Sparky developed it. When Sparky came from San Diego, everybody said, Sparky who? Because he was the third base coach for San Diego. Most street smart guy I've ever met in my life. Understood people. He used to tell me, think about this. Here's the way he treated his players. Three ways you could treat a player. Pat him on the ass, kick him in the ass, or leave him alone. 
You don't pat the guy needs kicked. You don't kick the guy needs left alone. If you're going to ask them to go to war for you every night, you got to know what makes them tick. And Sparky was the best at that. And then they, you know, we were such a good offense. Uh, Bench came along in 68. 68. Uh, Tommy Helms come along in 66. We just slowly but surely become the big red machine. I don't know when that started. I really don't remember. Well, yeah, you guys also had uh, you guys also had Joe Morgan, Tony Perez. Well, we got Joe know, Morgan, all Hall of Famers. Uh, yeah, well, T Perez came up in '67. Uh, mm -hmm. I come up '63. Maybe Perez was Helms was '66. Perez was '67. Bench was '68. So slowly but surely, the big red machine was being developed, and Sparky mm -hmm. was the beneficiary of developing the big red machine. We had a good team, man. We had we had good players at every position. Even oh, you guys our, back, an even our backup team. players were all stars. I'm talking about yep. Griffey, Geronimo, Foster. Those were all good players. Foster had 52 mm -hmm. home runs one year. Griffey had 300 several years. Geronimo won gold glove after gold glove. Concepcion, perennial all star. And then the rest of the guys were Hall of Famers: Morgan, Bench, Perez, and me. Mm -hmm. We had a good team, man. You had a great team. Yeah, we did. You had a great team. So then, in 73, the National League Championship versus the New York Mets. Yeah. What happened in Game 3 in the fifth inning? Um, somebody hit a double play ball. I forgot who it was. It might have been Bench. Uh, 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 Joe Morgan. Joe Morgan. Okay, Morgan. Mm -hmm. And... I went into Bud Harrelson, and you're playing in the playoffs. I'm, I'm trying to break up a double play, and I did what we call a pop-up. A pop-up slide is when you slide and you come up. And when I came up, my elbow hit Bud in the nose. I didn't try to hit him in the nose. I was trying to break up a double play. And he called me a name I can't repeat on your show. Maybe I can. You want me to repeat no, go it? Ahead. Yeah, go ahead and repeat it. I slid into him, and he said, you cocksucker. And I said, you don't know me that well, bud. And then Wayne Garrett come running in and started the whole melee. And then um, they threw so much garbage at me at right field, they had to call time to clean the field up. And uh, the umpire actually told Sparky, left field, I think it was. I was playing left field. And told Sparky to move me to Shea Stadium to move me to center field because there's no fa fans in the stands. Sparky said, I'm not screwing my defense up because you guys can't control these people. Then they told me not to go out that night for room service or have room service. Don't go out and eat in New York. Hmm. And after all of that, I ended up losing that playoff. And the Mets went to the World Series. New York, yeah. New, York uh, that, that can, game, New York fans can be on the edge, to say the least. Yeah. But they're yeah, great. No, they're that, great fans. that game was crazy. Huh? Uh, that game was crazy. No, well, that game was crazy. Um, the whole bench cleared. There was a huge brawl, like you said. Um, actually, Sparky had to pull the whole team off the field until until they restored order. You, you rarely see that. Yeah, you don't see that very yeah. often. That's the only time I've ever seen that. Uh, exactly, and that's and that's that was mostly. And I'm not criticizing the Met fans because they they support their team; they're good fans. But they were on edge, and we were on on the verge of beating them to go to the World Series, and they don't want no part of that. <laughs> right. I mean, it actually got so crazy that the Mets manager actually had to call Yogi Berra and, and Willie Mays had to, to go like to calm down field. the had crowd. The left field. Uh, yep. the, guy, the guy missed me this far from the third deck of a Jack Daniels bottle. Wow. Empty bottle. Miss uh. hit me in the head by this far. That's wow. when the umpire decided to go out. <laughs> but you know, they, the med fan, he emptied the damn bottle before he threw it at me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So he was twisted. He was drunk as hell. No, I was okay. Uh, yeah, bad aim, though. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> okay. You guys ended up losing, uh, even though you actually had a 381 uh, batting average in the series. Uh, you know, you hit the game winning home run to tie Off game of Harry one. Parker, day before. Yep. In the 12th inning. Yep. 
Okay, so unfortunately, you guys didn't go to the World Series that year. Right. But then the next year comes around, 1975. Now, you got moved to third base. Right. Was that was that different for you? Um, well, I had some I had some infield experience at second base before I went to left field. Uh, I remember Sparky called me in the office on on Monday or Tuesday, and he said, "Pete, we got to get some offense in this lineup, and I need you to move from left field to third base, so I can give George Foster a chance to get in the lineup." And I said, "Fine, Spark. You know when do you want me to move." He said, tomorrow. <laughs> so I come out to the ballpark the next day with George Scherger, great coach, and he hit me ground balls for about two hours, every direction. And I remember we were playing against the Braves, and the first guy up was a guy named Ralph Gar, who could run like a deer. And he topped one over the pitcher's head, and I came in and scooped it up and threw him out, and we went on to win two straight World Series. Because I could see, okay. I could see where me playing third base helped the team become a better team. Mm -hmm. And then I worked hard as anybody to per perfect third base, and it worked. It definitely worked. Yes, because that year you guys got to the World Series against the Boston Red Sox. How did you feel going into that game? The game or series? Well, this, I'm sorry, the series. How did you feel going into that well, series? Well, I, I felt good because we had a good year. You know, if you, if you win a pennant, you're having a good year. I didn't know much about the Red Sox at that time, just what the scouting uh, report said. Uh, hey, that was my first, that wasn't, that wasn't my first World Series. My first World Series, 72. And the playoffs mm -hmm. was bigger in a World Series, to say the least, against the Mets. In 75, uh, we felt like we belonged playing against the Red Sox. And I had a real good series that year. Matter of mm -hmm. fact, I won MVP in that series. Exactly. So you guys win in seven against the Boston Red Sox, and this is the first championship that you guys won since 1940. People call this the greatest World Series ever. Well, I think it was. And the reason I think it was is because Six of the seven games were one-run games. And, of course, uh, Carbo hit the home run to tie the game in game six. And Fisk hit the ball over my head at third base. But, unfortunately, it went over George Foster's head, too, in left field. And they won that game seven to six. So all the games were one-run games. And you had so, much, so many good players on each team. You know, they had our outfit. And you had just Skrimsky, you had Dewey Evans, you know, Jim Rice, uh, Freddie Lynn, you know, Louis Tiant, Bill Lee. I mean, they had a lot of good players too. Rico Petroselli. Uh, you know, they had a lot of good players too. And it was a World Series made in heaven because there was so many good players. So many good players playing against each, each other. And that's why it ended up being... Uh, the type of World Series you thought it might be. Well, yeah. Like you said, you won the MVP for that. I mean, how did it feel to win your first World Series and get the MVP on top of it? Well, even extra special because where was I born? Cincinnati, Ohio. Right there. Yep. Right down the street. Yeah. So, um, but I hit, when I hit 370 in that World Series? Uh, yep. This is exactly 10, 10 for 27. Something like that. And I had four, yep. four hits, walks or so. Exactly. Four walks or so. So uh, I, did, I had a really good offensive series. And it seems like every, every time I got a hit, it meant something. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're hitting in front of Morgan, Bench, and Perez, every hit does mean something. Well, yeah. I mean, not only did you win the World Series, you got the MVP, Sports Illustrated Sportsman of the Year. You got the Hickok Belt as the top professional athlete of the year. I mean, at that point, you were a legitimate superstar athlete. I mean, did things change in your life after all these accolades that year? Uh, not really. Uh, what, the, what that changes um, is how you feel about the game. 
uh, what do you expect about the game? You know, what do you, you know what you have to put into it now to get that much out of it. And that's one thing I did learn after a 75 season, that the sky's the limit. So reach for the sky every day. You know, we come back to next year and we bettered ourselves. What did we do? We swept the Yankees four in a row. That doesn't happen very often. You know, go, you go from the best World Series ever to one of the most boring series ever. The only thing, the only thing I enjoyed about the 76 World Series other than we won uh, was playing against Thurman Munson. He was a hell of a player. And I got to, I got to talk to him every time up because he's a catcher. Mm -hmm. You know, I, well, I, and, and another guy that I didn't get to talk to because he played left field, who's a great guy even today, Lou Pinella. I mean, those are two of my favorite players on the Yankees. Uh, got to talk to Thurman because when you hit, you're in the batter's box. But losing left field, you get to talk to him very much unless you're selling beer in the front row. Okay, let's talk about 76 for a second. So in 76, yep. you guys were the only team since the expansion of the playoffs to go undefeated in the postseason. Yeah. We swept the Phillies. You guys completely, completely on fire that year. Yeah. We swept the Phillies and we swept the Yankees. Mm -hmm. Correct? Right. Yep. Well, yeah, that year, well, the, you hardest guys thing World to do, Series. the hardest thing to do there was uh, uh, sweeping the Phillies uh, because it's only three out of five. In our case, it was three out of three. The World Series right. was four out of seven. So yep. we won seven straight uh, postseason games. Exactly. You guys play the Phillies in the World Series, and you win again. Now I you did have... good. I did good in that uh, Philly series too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were a major force in that, huh? Uh, you were a major force in that. Yeah, yeah. And now but you I have always two hit World the series. I, I I could always hit the Philly pitching staff. Don't ask me why, but I I just could. <laughs> okay, so then we get to seventy eight. Yeah, you hit your three thousandth hit on May fifth. Yeah. 13th player in Major League history to do that. Once you did that, was was 4,000 already on your radar? Okay, I hit the 3,000. Well, you know, based 4, on my age next. and the way I felt, uh, you never look ahead that far. Uh, but I was pretty fortunate because I never had major injuries. And I mm -hmm. could still hit. I could still play. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't like I needed 10 more years to get a thousand hits, you know? So, uh, I didn't, I didn't realize I could break the record. Okay. Until 84, when I came from Montreal back to Cincinnati as player manager. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I played that year the last six weeks of the season as player manager, and I hit 370. So that kind of gave me the opportunity to play in 85. Mm -hmm. Now, if I came back to Cincinnati as player manager and hit, hit 170, I probably wouldn't have took a roster spot for the 75 season, or excuse me, the 85 season. So I, I earned the right to pursue Ty Cobb Strictly because of what I did the year before, going back to Cincinnati as player manager. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense, and we'll and we'll get to all that. But that's that's part of you know that's part of the whole story. But what I wanted to say was that same year that you hit three thousand. That was when you started off of Steve on your Rogers. Off of Steve Rogers. Yep, off of Steve Rogers exactly at Riverfront Stadium. But that same year is when you started going on your forty-four game hitting streak. Right. Um, 78. And, you know, right. This was 78. And, of course, Joe DiMaggio has the record of 56 games. Right. Now, did you feel at that point like you're you're seriously going to beat it? Because, like you said, it's a lot of skill, but it's also some luck involved. Well, there's a lot of luck involved. But uh, uh, the whole thing with me, that that particular period of time was – uh, earning, earning, I'm 44 years old, earning the right mm -hmm. to play the next year. 
right? Because if I'd have came back as, mm -hmm. as player manager and flopped, I wouldn't have been on the roster in 85. But because I hit 370, that's a legitimate 370 for six and a half weeks of the season. It gave me the opportunity to play in 85. And that's when I broke the record. But well, the record uh, carried me because uh, I knew I was within range. I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to get forty-one, forty-one sixty, or forty-one seven. I was either going to get forty-one ninety-three, or not another hit. You know, I wasn't going to finish second or third on the hit list. I was going to be number one. Okay, so you're going on this forty-four game hitting streak. And then you guys play the Atlanta Braves uh, with Gene Garber. You were pretty upset over the way he actually handled <laughs> that whole situation. Uh, well, first of all, uh, McWilliams started that game, left-hander. And first of all, I want everybody to know that a pitcher is not supposed to go out there and lay it right down the middle for you. You understand what I'm saying? And what mm -hmm. pissed me off about Garber was um, the score was 17 to four, favor the Braves, ninth inning, two outs, nobody on. Mm -hmm. If I don't went up to bat without a bat, just stepped in the batter's box, I'd have walked on four pitches. So I was pissed that he didn't come right at me. You understand what I'm saying? Because he knew I had a swing. Because the streak's at the end. And uh, I'm not going to swing at a ball that's going to be three feet outside or bounce on the, on the dirt. He had me by the balls. And uh, when he struck me out, he jumped five feet in the air. It was like a World Series to him. And I'm just saying... Why didn't you come right at me? If you're going to get me out, get me out. But don't uh, make me go fishing for a hit because I was not a bad ball hitter. That's that's what pissed me off. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a hell of a run anyways. Yeah, 44 well, games yeah, is still 44 games. Yeah. Yeah, it was, um, it was fun. It was fun. But that's what I was paid to do, hitting. Mm -hmm. I just happened to do yep. it 44 straight days. Yep. And I'll tell you okay. what, that, that, so streak, that, next year, that streak did one thing, I think. That streak really helped baseball. Because everywhere I went, once I got over 30, 32, 33, uh, the ballparks were selling out. So I made the owners a lot of money in 78 by going on hit. I did, by going on the hitting streak. You know, like I said, there yeah. was 40-some thousand at the game in Atlanta where they're used to drawing twelve or 14,000. You know, that's 25 more thousand people. That's a lot of bucks in Ted Turner's pocket. He knew it. Mm -hmm. But what are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> okay, so that next year, you became a free agent. Yeah, 79. Now, 79, exactly. So considering the massive amount of success with the Reds, why didn't they keep you? Uh, well, I can't answer that question, but, uh, they weren't into paying big salaries. And at the time they kind of made up their mind between me and Morgan hmm. and Morgan was a little bit younger. So they signed Morgan to that contract instead of me, but I got to pick where I wanted to go. You know, I right. could have went 38 at the, you, you were 38 at the time. Yeah. So. You know, for baseball, you're right. You know, there's probably some questions as to your ability. But, I mean, but you were still on fire, you know, in terms of the stats. Um, so Well, they, they knew my you, dad played football when he was 43. So they mm -hmm. knew my history. They knew I didn't drink. They knew I didn't smoke. They knew I took care of myself. So, you know, your, your, your career is going to last longer if you take care of yourself as opposed to going out every night and getting drunk. You know, so um, I could still play. I could, I could really still play. Mm -hmm. Well, you ended up getting picked up by the Phillies. Yeah. 
I chose and the, I chose the, time, the Phillies. I didn't get picked up by you, the Phillies. I chose, chose the, the Phillies. Phillies. Why did I choose? Right. Well, yeah, well, you, you, were, you were a free agent at the time, so you yeah. get to choose where you want to go. Exactly. I chose the Phillies because I was good friends with Schmidt, Lazinski, Boa. That was the guts of that order. And I always figured that in the 70s, the Philly problem was the Reds. So if I leave the Reds, they don't have that problem no more. <laughs> and, I, and, I chose, and I chose right because we went to the series in 80. We went to the series in 83, playoffs in 82. We were a good team. Yep. But see, I was used to being around Hall of Fame players. Even when, I played, well, yeah. even when I played in Montreal, I had three Hall of Fame players in that lineup. Ooh. Dawson, Reigns, and Carter. You know, I had the least amount of Hall of Famers with Philly than I did Montreal or Cincinnati hmm. as teammates. Well, when you joined the Phillies, you signed a four-year, $3.2 million contract, which at the time made you the highest paid athlete in all of team sports. Correct. I was 800, 800 some thousand a year. Yeah. I mean, and I played a new position. Days, I played a new position too. Right. I mean, these days, I mean, even in today's dollars, that's not a huge amount of money. But back then, like I said, you were the highest paid athlete in all of sports. Right. Did you buy anything special after you signed that deal? I don't remember. I was just, uh, <laughs> It was a load off your shoulders. You know, it was hard to turn down Ted Turner. Hmm. Uh, it was hard to turn down Augie Bush. I mean, when you think about it, uh, it, ended up, it ended up okay for me, but Augie Bush offered me a Budweiser distributorship. Okay. I, I wish I'd have took that. <laughs> right. I'd still be making <laughs> bucks today. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so... You joined the Phillies, and the first year, you guys missed the postseason. I did good, though. But you did good. But then that next year, you guys get to the World Series versus the Kansas City, versus the Kansas City Royals. Yes. One in six games. Yes. But more importantly than winning that World Series, that was the first Phillies World Series title in 86 years. A million people hit the streets. The parade? Yeah. Most, the awesome, parade. most awesome thing I've ever seen. Yes. We were on floats going out to uh, JFK, mm -hmm. which was 65,000 sitting waiting for us. Was that your favorite World Series win, you think, in retrospect? No. no. The first one. The first one. First one. That was a big one. I mean, because it meant because it meant so much to so many people. Right. You know, you said the first, right. first time in eighty years. In eighty six years. That's a long time. That's a long time. There were yeah. probably three guys that were living then were at the parade. <laughs> I know, right? And they're probably about one years old when, you know, they won last but, time. But the, but the Philly fans, are, they're, they're the greatest. I mean, I love the Philly fans. I mean, they just, they love the Phillies. And uh, I got to choose where I wanted to go. I didn't want to go to the Yankees. I, I, I didn't think I could help Atlanta win. Uh, I didn't want to go to St. Louis to replace Lou Brock. You know, there was a lot of different things that added up to, to going somewhere like Philadelphia because they had, they had good players. You know, when you got the Schmitz and the Bones and the Red Trios and Boas and Lazinskis and Maddoxes and McBrides and, and McCarver, those, those guys were all really uh, part, of my, part of my select in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Well, then next year in 83, you actually had the worst season of your career. You only batted uh, 245 with 121 hits. And they ended up benching you uh, during the last part of the season. Yeah. And, um, you know, that that caused a problem, obviously. Um, you know, even though they played, you know, they got to the World Series again, 
They played the Orioles. They lost. But at that point, what made you decide that you were done with the Phillies? What made me decide what? That you were done with the Phillies. Just because they, they benched me. Hmm. You know, when you're 43, 30, 42 years old and you get benched, uh, the, the handwriting's on the wall. And they had a young prospect, really nice guy, Len Matuzak, who they wanted to get playing time. Uh, I understood that. And uh, I thanked him for the opportunity and went about my business. Right. And then you went to the Montreal Expos. Yeah. How was that? Um, it was fun because uh, we had some good players. You know, that's another team where I had three Hall of Famers on the team. Reigns, Dawson, and Car J Gary Carter. I had Francona, I had Wallach, I had Chris Spire, Steve Rogers, Charlie Lee, Jeff Reardon. Uh, we, we had good players. Uh, that was one of them deals, uh, and, and I'm not bad-mouthing anybody when I say this, but uh, Bill Verdon was the manager and really a nice guy. But Bill Verdon wasn't the right guy for that group of guys. We needed, we needed a, a Sparky Anderson, Danny Ozark type, type of manager, not a guy that... Never said anything. It was so laid back, you know, and uh, I think that caught up with us, you know, because a player, a player plays like his team's attitude. And uh, we had kind of a different attitude with that team. I don't know if it was playing in Montreal or what it was, but uh, we should have did better. We did. Well, I think the first was with I think the first mistake he made was putting me in left field and putting Francona at first base. Mm -hmm. He should have put me at first base and Francona in left field because I'm I'm kind of a noisemaker whenever I wherever I played, and you can be more of a noisemaker at first base than you can at left field. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah. And not that I did poorly in left field. But I just come off of five great years at first base with Philly. So why do you want to change that? I was a lot better first baseman than Francona was. Mm -hmm. Well, it was with the Expos that you hit your 4,000th career day, day off of uh, Jerry Kuzman. Yep. Yep. Which meant that you were the second player to ever do that after Ty Cobb. Yeah. How did that feel? A huge accomplishment. Well, <laughs> accomplishments feel different uh, if you're running out of time. Now, if that had been the last day of the season and you know you got to get a hit to get 4,000, it creates a lot of problems. But because it's opening day, I got 162 games to get one hit for 4,000. Get 100, uh, 193 for the all time record. So mm -hmm. that's the way I approach things. But it was fun when it happened. Uh, I don't think they were used to mementos up in Montreal with the baseball team. Yeah. With the baseball team. Yeah. I don't even, th I don't even think the players understood uh, to come out to second base to uh, congratulate me because they hit a double. It's like everybody was real shy. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, you played 95 games with the Expos, and then you got traded back to the Reds. As player manager. Exactly. Now It's a big deal. Right. Well, were you the last player manager in the MLB? Yeah. The one for okay. me was uh, uh, Lou Boudreau for the Cubs. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, can't, explain, that, can't, that can't happen today I mean, explain what a player manager is exactly you're the boss you're okay. the boss you make the lineup out they go by your set mm -hmm. of rules see you, you you couldn't be a player manager today because uh, it's a full day it's, it's, it's a full day's work if you're a manager 
You know, because you're not only responsible for yourself as a player manager, but you're responsible for the other 24 players. And um, you just don't have enough time in the day to be a player manager today. Because the most important thing for a manager today, I think, uh, it's a couple really important things. One, getting most out of your players. But two, and maybe more, more importantly, you got to entertain the press. You got to take care of the press. No matter what the situation is, you got to talk to the press. You can't be a player manager today and say, I don't want to talk to the press today. I'm not talking. Don't come in my office. It doesn't work that way. And uh, because of that, it, it limits your time. I almost start running out of time to take batting practice. You know what I mean? Because I had to be with the press. Mm -hmm. Had to be entertaining all the guys who followed the, the Expos. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I did okay. okay with it. I mean, I, 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 yeah. I, I've always understood the press. I've always been a, uh, the press's uh, delight. Why? Because <laughs> I always pro uh, cooperated with them. And I always yeah. had something to say. They'd always come to me, me or Bench, okay? Me or Gary Carter, me or Mike Schmidt. And if they're busy, you gotta talk to me. Okay, so now you're playing back in Cincinnati again. And then September 11th, 1985 happens. Where you broke Ty Cobb's all-time hit record with 4,192 hits. That was the first time you actually cried on the field. Um, yeah. Um, but it took nine minutes. I got a nine-minute staying ovation. Actually, it took about seven and a half. Uh, and not until I looked up in the sky, I started thinking about my dad or my uncle who signed me. That's what brought the tears, not getting the hit. You know, um, I don't know if you've ever been anywhere where someone gave you a nine minute staying ovation. I doubt it, but, which is not nope. a bad thing. Uh, that was the only time in my career during that nine minutes, I didn't know what to do on the field. They took the base. I'm standing out in front of this 52,000 people going crazy for not six minutes, not seven, nine. And I don't know if they made me feel uncomfortable. Uh, it was the first inning, so we had all night to play the game. And I ended up scoring two runs that night. We won the game two to nothing. Next time up, I got a triple. I wonder, wonder what it would have been like if I'd have got a triple instead of a single. Mm. And when I got the single to beat the record, uh, this is the type of player I was. I go back to first, and I'm pissed that I didn't take two. Because when the ball hit in front of Martinez in left field, it took a real high hop. And no outfielder is going to throw me out of second if the ball takes a high, a high hop where he's got to jump up to catch it. You understand what I'm saying? It was on AstroTurk. Mm -hmm. And... I'm saying I should have had a double instead of a single. I should have <laughs> kept going. You know, because I got the first just as fast as I always got the first. Mm -hmm. Then your son comes out. And all your the first guy to come out was Tommy Helms, who I played with in 19, uh, uh, 1962 at Macon. I hit, at, I hit before him. I hit first and he had second for Macon. And uh, I scored 136 runs that year because he hit behind me and got a couple hundred hits and hit 340, and I hit 330. <laughs> so we were offense from the beginning. It's all about teammates, buddy. Yep. Yep. Well, a hell of an accolade. A hell of an accolade because at the end of the day, nobody has – beating your record or even come close. Well, I'll, I'll die the hit king. If I had a bet, exactly. my son, my sons would die the hit king because that's not the way, that's not the way they play today. 
They don't mm -hmm. play long enough. They make too much money, which is good for them. And you got to play over 20 years to get 4,000 hits. That's getting 200 a year. And only one or two guys will get 200 every year. And it's not the same guy. You understand what I'm saying? It's hard mm -hmm. to get 4,000 hits. No, it's yeah. hard to get 4,000 at bats. It is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But when you don't, when you never get hurt and you can hit a baseball and you play every day and you're on a good team, things will just keep multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. I was lucky, man. I was lucky. Uh, I was always in good timing. Mm -hmm. Good spot. It's a good spot in the order. Never hit, never hit Larry, uh, less than third in my career, ever in a game. And I played 3,500 games. Yeah. Even as a rookie, I let off. Mm -hmm. Well, in 2010, uh, Deadspin did a report. And Who? they claimed that you were uh, Deadspin. It's a website. Yeah. They did a report and they claimed that you were corking bats during 85 as you were, no, you were approaching the record. I cork no bats. What I need to cork bats for? If I cork bats, I'd, I'd make more outs because the ball would go further and those line drive would be outs now. You know what I'm saying? We had, we had a couple cork bats that we used in BP because that's all for your confidence. But I'd be scared to go up the bat with a cork bat because if, if the umpire checked on it or the opposition checked on it, it would ruin your whole career. No one ever caught me with a cork bat in the in the batter's box in the big leagues. Well, according to the report, they said that two uh, sports memorabilia collectors who own some of your game used bats, they actually x-rayed the bats. Well, and found no, wait, no, let me stop you right there. Let me stop you right there. Okay. Okay. Because I got one friend of mine in Cincinnati. His name's Arnold Metz. To my knowledge, is the only person in this world that ever got a game used bat from me, and I gave it to him at their opening day one of the years I was in Cincinnati. So for these guys to say they bought a memorabilia bat at a card show that's got a cork in it, they're full of bullshit. Okay, it's impossible. Because they didn't get it from me. You know, I would not... I, I, I batted, I batted 16,000 times, okay? And I never remember breaking a bat during the game at, in the batter's box. So who's getting all these game-used bats unless they stole them from me somewhere? And when I went to the ballpark and I went to the bench, I had a little thing, like a, like a pool thing. You carry pool ball, uh, pool sticks in. And I took two, two bats to the bench, put them in a bat rock or rack. After the game, take them out, put them back in my bag, and go back and put them in my locker. No one ever got in my locker and took bats to the, uh, to the bench. I was in charge of my bats. And like I said, I never, never broke a bat in a game. There That's a have. fact. That's a fact. Okay. Just like I never, just like I had, I, to, just I, like had I, never, to, I had to bring it up though. Just like I, I never, had to bring I it never up. remember, and I'm, I'm sure I did. I never remember hitting a pop up to a third baseman or a first baseman in foul ground. I just didn't do it. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. And I probably did with with fifteen thousand at bats, but I never can remember hitting a pop fly to a first baseman in foul ground or a third baseman in foul ground. Just like I never remember breaking a bat in a game. I used to have a problem with bats on the end because I used them so much that they splinter. Not the handle, the end. Because I wipe them down with, with babe, uh, alcohol every night to clean my bats off every night. That's why I took them to my locker. No, no bat boy ever took care of my bats. That was my job. That was my... Uh, Two. All right, there you have it. Well, well you so know, that's, that's your that's your first bad story so far. 
That's my first bad story. Okay. We'll see how many more I have along the way. Well, uh, in June 15th, 2016, uh, Ichiro Suzuki, he hit his 4,257th career hit. But that's counting all the Japanese league hits that he had also. Okay. And I guess... Let me uh, stop you right there. Let me stop you right there. Mm -hmm. Okay. If that's the case, why didn't they count my minor league hits? Right. Exactly. I was about to I mean, say that. So because... I played in Japan. Japan's I played in AAA. Right. I mean, I'm not I'm not bad mouthing them. You know, no, Ishi, I, I, Ishi, I was about Ishi, to say Ro, that Ishi Ro could hit, but he didn't get as many hits as me. I got yeah, I got forty two fifty six plus. I got several hundred in the minor leagues. So they they mm -hmm. want to count his Japanese hits. Don't want to count my American Double A and A ball hits. That's just people who don't like Pete Rose. Right. Well, because you actually made a comment. You said, I'm not trying to take away uh, from Ichiro. He's, you know, he's had a Hall of Fame career. Yeah. But the next thing you know, you'll be counting his high school hits. Well, unless you get him in the big leagues, I don't want to hear about him. I agree. Because, because, uh, and I got a lot of respect for the Japanese players, but it's not the major leagues. I played over there. I know all about it. I went all, yep. I, I, I played over there. I know, I know all about the Japanese players. And, uh, yeah, no, I agree. I, I completely agree. Okay. So then 1986 comes around. You're age 45 at this point. Yeah. Uh, you got dropped from the Reds 40 man roster. Right. Uh, to make room for the pitcher. Uh, Pat Pachillo. Patillo. Yeah. I don't remember but, that. I, so, I don't remember that. Yep. Yeah. I remember him. Right. And at that point, you essentially retired as a player. Um, I actually was playing that year some. And I just yeah. decided, uh, because one of my best friends in life, even today, is a guy named Tony Perez. Uh, he was chasing the all-time Latino record for home runs. And instead of continuing to platoon with Tony Perez, I just quit playing and let him play the last month of the season every day. So I guess what I'm saying in reality, I never did retire. I never did mm. announce I'm retiring. I just quit playing. Right. And uh, I, I, always, mean, I always thought if someone would ever beat my record, I could still come back and get one more hit. <laughs> get one more hit? Yeah. <laughs> Well, right, because uh, by that time, you'd played for 24 seasons. Yeah. You had a lifetime batting average of 303. Uh, you had gotten 4,256 hits. Uh, you had played an all-time record for games played at 3,562. You had won three World Series, three batting titles, an MVP, two gold gloves, and a Rookie of the Year award. Uh, you were basically leaving the game as one of the most celebrated players ever. You don't want to award I mean, I, you don't want to award I never won. I never won to be eligible for. What's that? Comeback player of the year. Comeback player of the year. No, that's, you didn't get that's that. That's one thing you never want in your resume. Go ahead. Right. Right. So essentially after you retired or whatever you want to call it, you stayed on with the Reds and became a manager. Yeah. But why'd you decide to do that? Uh well, because I could. I was making good money. And I'm still associated with the game. Mm -hmm. And I love my players. Had a lot of faith in my players. Mm -hmm. You know, the Paul O'Neills and the Eric Davises and uh, Barry Larkins and Chris Sabos. And, you know, those were all really good players. That's why they won the championship in 1990 after I left in 89. So that in 88, you're a manager and you guys had a home game against the Mets. Things went a little crazy that game. What happened? Well, uh, Mookie Wilson, uh, he hit what looked like a routine ground ball to the shortstop. Uh, but the throw to first base was wide and, you know, it pulled the first baseman's foot off the bag. And then the umpire, uh, Dave Pallone, he didn't make the safe call. 
You know what I'm talking about here? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Where the so guy, the first where base the guy was, scored from second? Yeah. Because the first po- baseman be, waited for the call no, because instead of making Dave the play Pallone at the plate. Was, because Dave Pallone was down on his knee uh, making a late call. And by the time exactly. I knew I knew he called him safe, the guy had already rounded second, uh, third from second base and scored a, a winning run. That pissed mm-hmm. me off because he didn't give me time to react. Right. And that's so when that, you got on the field and you started arguing with the Empire. Yeah. Very seldom. What happened next? Uh, I shoved him because he poked me. He poked me right here and made me bleed. Well, like that, I saw him and I pushed him. And I got a 30-day suspension. So that was a deal where an umpire put his hands on me instead of me putting hands on the umpire. Well, uh, Pallone, he wrote a book. And there was a whole chapter about that incident. He said that he never touched you. And the National League personnel Where did blood blood come from my face right here? Right here. I'm not not saying it's not true. I'm just saying he did not. I was there. I was there. Yeah. I remember. So for him to get write a book and say he didn't touch me, he's a lying piece of shit. I hate to say that, but that's what he is. And I like Dave Pallone. You know. Uh, but for him to say he didn't touch me, why else? Why, why else would I react the way I reacted? Well, after that incident with Pallone happened, all hell broke loose. Fans started throwing radios and cigarette lighters on the field. Uh, They had to suspend the game for 15 minutes. And when the dust settled, well, Pallone actually ended up leaving the field and they had to finish the game with three umpires. And after all was said and done, you got suspended for 30 days, which is the longest suspension ever for an on-field incident with a manager. Do you feel like that was overkill? Yeah, because he's the one who screwed up. First of all, he missed the call. Second, secondly, then he poked me almost in the eye. So I guess I'm lucky I didn't punch him. <laughs> Just shoved him. Because normally I would punch somebody that did that. Because okay. the, fans, the fans could see, could, first of all, they could see he blew the call. You know, mm-hmm. down on his knees acting like Hollywood. Yeah, I agree. That's, I don't know, life's too, too, too short yeah. to even worry about something like that. Okay. So then 1989 rolls around. Yeah. Now, reports start to circle that you were betting on baseball games. And originally, you were informally questioned in February of that year. Um, and you denied the allegations. And by that time, Giamatti, you know, was running things. And, you know, it was relatively quiet until Sports Illustrated actually released a detailed report on the allegations. You know, they say that you had placed bets on baseball games on March 21st, 1989. It dated back to April 3rd. Um, You know, then rumors started to to circle that you weren't paying some of the bookies. They were saying that the mob was involved and so forth. And and first of all, the story story started to get crazy. First of all, why would I be betting on a baseball game in March? So got, it's a spring training game. Are they? Are, is that report saying I bet on spring training games? That's what you're saying. Yeah. The last time I checked, we didn't play no major league games in March. Does that make any sense to you? Well, okay. Well, hold on. This might be wrong. I, I think maybe that the the Sports Illustrated came out on that date. So I don't think you'll say you were betting on that date, but I think that that's when the report came out. So so that might actually be my mistake. Uh, just tell you, 89 is when I start betting on baseball. It's, okay. not, it's not a secret. Not a secret. Because uh, I believed in my players, I believed in my team, and I believe we we're going to win every game. And I, and I was a gambler. So if you're a gambler, you're kind of looking for an edge. And the edge was that... Uh, I'm running the game. 
I didn't run the game any differently betting on it than not betting on it. I, I, I managed every game to win the game. And no one will ever say you could tell I was gambling on this or that because of the way I run the game. I never made a blunder in a decision, whether it was this pinch hitter or that pinch hitter or this relief pitcher or that relief pitcher. I was always consistent with the way I run the game. Now I ask your questions. Okay. Well, they brought in a lawyer named John M. Dowd to investigate the whole situation. His strike force guy. He used yeah. to put mafia types behind bars. Right. Uh, according to the report, they're saying that you allegedly bet on 52 Reds games in 1987 and you're bet betting a minimum of $10,000 a day. No, that's not true. That's, I wouldn't make it that much money to bet 10000 a day. See, I, I get a kick out of you guys in the press. You always go on these goddamn reports. Reports from 50 years ago. How am I supposed to know what's in a report 50 years ago? Can you tell you got me pissed off right now? Can you tell that? I can tell. Okay? Yeah. Because I don't want to hear about reports. I want someone to sign their goddamn name to a, to a report. Betting $10,000 a day. Christ, I'm not making enough bet 10000 a day. And you're going to also say I've, I've stiffed bookmakers? I've never sti stiffed a bookmaker in my life. Okay? But the report said I did. Who's the report? John Dowd? Well, the, rep the report also said there was no evidence that you actually bet against the Reds. Well, no shit. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. That's not, that's yesterday's newspapers. Right. Right. But unfortunately, the way it's set out, that, it vi you know, you violated a rule where you can't bet Against the game. I understood. Game. I understand. I broke yeah. the rules. Okay. Let me explain something to you. I broke the rules. It cost me a hundred million. That's what it cost me by breaking the rules. So I don't want to hear about breaking the rules. Hundred million dollars. It cost me betting on baseball. Right. So who got penalized the most? You? The guy you give did. the report? I did. You did. I did. Right. Well, initially you denied it and you filed a lawsuit. Well, I, I denied it because my lawyers told me to because I, I didn't think they had any proof. Okay. So you filed the lawsuit and it, it went through the whole process and you guys went into negotiations. And then on August 24th, 1989, you voluntarily accepted a permanent place on baseball's ineligible list. Now, from what I understand, originally when you signed that deal, it was only supposed to be for one year, right? Yeah. But then Giamatti died, what, eight days later? Seven, eight days. Seven days later. God rest his soul. Had he lived, do you think that things would have worked out a lot? Yes. Time? Yes. Because I, to be honest with you, uh, I was manager when Giamatti was the league president, National League. You remember that? Or mm -hmm. do you? Okay. And he'd be on the road occasionally when we were on the road playing. And once a month or every so often, I would go up to his room and talk about the game of baseball, how we can make it better. And he was a fan. And I truly believe if he hadn't died of it, a heart attack, but there again, he was 80 pounds overweight and he smoked six packs of cigarette a day, which is very unusual for, for a guy as intelligent as Bart Giamatti. I believe he would have given me a second chance. Of course, when he died, who took over? Uh, Faye Vinson. Then when he left, who took over? Bud Selig. Now, none of those guys are going to step on each other's toes by giving me a second chance. I could have beat my wife. I could have robbed a store or robbed a bank. I could have did this or did that. I could have smoked marijuana every day of my life. I'd have been given a second chance. And I understand what happened in 1919 with the Black Sox scandal, probably more so than most. Mm -hmm. But this is in 1919. 
This was 1989. Yeah, I mean, you got the short end of the stick. Well, because like like no, you said, I, it, was never, one year, say, it was a one-year deal. I'll never say I got the short end of the stick because I'm the one that caused the problem. Mm -hmm. I'm the one that made a mistake. Okay, I'm the one that made a mistake. But the one that made a mistake should be given a second chance. I agree. I didn't kill anybody. Yeah. I didn't bet against my team. Uh, I just showed respect and love for my players because I thought I could win every game. And I won a lot more than I lost. Mm -hmm. And maybe I knew that going in, that in the long run, I'm going to win a lot more games than I'm going to lose. So I'm going to come out ahead. Does that make any sense? No, of course. I mean, did you feel, because uh, right around that time, didn't you go into therapy for gambling addiction? Uh, well, it didn't last long because I didn't understand what they were saying. Okay. Uh, it was a professor at uh, Cincinnati. Dr. Hilliard, I believe his name was. Uh, mm -hmm. Because it's like going to a, a, a gambling anonymous. I never did. But to, to hear some of the accusations that they did, I didn't do none of that. It's like going to a, a, a place that you smoke and you're trying to stop smoking and they start saying this happened, that happened, this happened, this happened. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there listening to these guys talk about gambling. I'm saying, what the hell are they doing? All I did is bet on a baseball game or a football game or a basketball game. Mm -hmm. You know, now what happens today? Everybody bets on every sport. Baseball's got gambling well, all over its, its, its channels. Yeah. I mean, I just interviewed uh, Tim Donaghy. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He was the, the, referee? the NBA ref. Yeah. Yeah, who got caught betting on his own games. And, you know, he went to prison and, you know, he, he lost his career and everything else like that. There was some mob situations going on. And, uh, you know, listen, he, he described himself as a degenerate gambler. Would you consider at one point you were a degenerate gambler? As bad as you could be. Absolutely. No doubt about it. it. It, like I said, it, it consumed my life when I would be on the road. You know, I would hear that USA Today hit outside the door. They would drop the newspaper outside your hotel room door and it would be about six o'clock in the morning and I'd wake up. This was before computers and everything just to see what the lines were in the games that day. You know, he knew yeah, that he, he had a serious he was, problem. He, he was shaving points and stuff. Well, no. Not, not according to him. No. If he's if he's if he's betting on a basketball game and the team is minus two, and they're up three with five seconds to go, and he calls it uh, a, a foul, and now the team loses by one, and he had the two, he wins. So no, that's a, that's a that. tricky I, situation. It is. It is. Um, and you know, according to him, based on you know, I mean, I read through the whole report. Based on the NBA investigation, they couldn't find any bad calls that he made in order to win. But from his point of view, he knew which refs had problems with certain players. So he was able to win 70 or 80 percent of the time just knowing the relationships between the refs well, and the players. If, if you did that much research on, on, on him, then you have to know that I, did, I had no shady situations as a manager of the Reds. I, I think you'll say that. I, I think you would say that. I'm saying that right now. I mean, I'm you saying know, it because because there wasn't yeah. any, there wasn't right. any. But but unfortunately, the rules are the rules. I you understand. got caught in the I middle understand. of that situation. I understand. Yeah, that whole era kind of set off a bad chain of events for you because after well, you had to leave you, baseball. Well, let me explain something to you. Okay, you're talking about the the IRS where I underpaid my taxes by three percent. Correct. Three percent. Yes. I paid them 160 some thousand. They said I owed them 180. That's the yes. IRS you're talking about? That's okay. the IRS. As long as we got that about. straight. As long as we got that straight. Exactly. It's not well, like I didn't pay they... taxes. I paid $2.2 no. no. two in, in the year in question. Right. Well, according to reports, they're basically saying that There's you did pay taxes. Reports again. But, you know, they're saying that you didn't pay taxes on selling autographs and memorabilia and some of your horse race winnings, which owed, which was added up to about 162000 which in the grand scheme of things, is a very small amount considering the whole amount. Now, with most people, 
you know, I've been audited. If you owe some money, you pay, you pay the penalties. Why do you think you got sent to prison over that situation? I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. Well, yeah. because it, it, it came at a time when uh, the IRS tries to get across to everybody. Don't duck us. We'll find you. Now, if they're going to find me, they're going to find John Doe. Mm -hmm. Well, you end up doing five months in a medium security prison camp. Uh, you got fined 50000 Now, this is the first time you've ever been locked up. Uh, how is that whole experience like? Well, there were no locks. I mean, we had a barracks. USP okay. Marion is the uh, uh, most secure prison in this country, or was. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when there was 250 inmates, uh, I was the only one guilty. And they all told me their story. Mm -hmm. They were all innocent. They were all innocent. <laughs> Every 249 guy, of them were innocent. <laughs> okay. So you got out. In uh, January 7th, 1991, you had to pay $366,000 in back taxes and interest, and you had to do 1,000 hours of community service. Um, so on February 4th, 1991, the Hall of Fame voted formally to exclude individuals on a permanently ineligible list from getting into the Hall of Fame. Change the rules for, on my behalf again. They changed the rules on your behalf. Yeah. <laughs> Had you not been banned, you would have absolutely gotten in the Hall of Fame starting in 1992. I mean, the, the, the numbers are, are indisputable. How hard did you take it when you found out you're not getting into the Hall of Fame? Um, I don't remember. It, it, it was difficult, but uh, hey... It's been almost 30 years now. So uh, you got to, eventually you got to quit worrying about it. I know, what, I know what kind of player I was. My fans know what kind of player I was. My teammates, my opposition knew what kind of player I was. You know what I mean? And uh, you're not going to put you in the Hall of Fame because you bet on your team to win? Do you really think I'm the only player ever to bet on baseball? No one can be that naive. Yeah. So uh, I'll have to wait till I die, and I won't be part of it, but uh, that's when it'll put me in after I, after I die, which would be too late for my family and my friends. Well, yeah. I mean, along the way, you know, 1982, you petitioned, uh, you know, to try to get your name into the Hall of Fame. You got denied in 2015. You applied again. Once again, denied. Um, you, you know, it was one of those things where you definitely tried. And me and most of the rest of the fans feel like you should be in there. But, you know, the guys that are in charge have consistently not agreed with you and, and have banned you the whole time. One guy. And, and the, one guy. One guy. The commissioner. Well, the commissioner. Right, but there's been a couple of different commissioners along the way. Well, they're not going to they're not going to shit on the commission before them by overruling yeah. something, right? So they're going to agree with him, right? Because I remember in 2015, uh, you know, the commissioner Rob Manfred, you know, said that you did not have a mature understanding of your wrongful conduct and the damage it had done to the game, and for these reasons. Uh, he felt you'd be an unacceptable risk to let you to the Hall of Fame. <laughs> I want to, I want to, can you explain to me what harm I did to the game? I know what harm I did to myself and my family. What harm did I do to the game? Yep. Can Mr. Manford explain that to me? With what they do to the game today, it's amazing. It's it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. And I like Rob Manfred. I think he's uh, doing a good job. But he's finally got the uh, steroids and stuff cleaned up. We think until next month they'll find someone else. Well, I mean, how do you feel? I mean, I've interviewed Ho Jose Canseco, who's not in the Hall of Fame. Well, in 2007... 
you received six Hall of Fame votes, which was 1.1% of the ballots. You needed 5% to get that. Do you feel like you'll ever get in the Hall of Fame? No, and I should not because my numbers don't qualify. I was injured too many times. I didn't play enough. Um, if I were not injured, I think I ranked 12 or 13th in the world home runs per at bat. I just didn't play enough. So my numbers just don't qualify. Yes, if I would have played 20 years, 22 years, at the home run per at bat ratio, I would have hit over 750 home runs, maybe 800 home runs. But I just, my career was cut short and I was too injured. Barry Bonds, not in the Hall of Fame. Well, Barry Bonds Sammy belongs Sosa. in the Hall of Fame. Jose Canseco don't. He don't okay. have Hall of Fame numbers. Okay, but Barry Bonds definitely does. No question about it. And I don't know what uh, Barry Bonds did. I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you what Barry Bonds did. Oh, I can tell you he's a friend of mine, and he had a, a okay. tremendous record. And if he took steroids, he didn't take him his whole career. He was a really good player when he played for the Pirates. Mm-hmm. Sammy Sosa, not in the Hall of Fame. He's got pretty good numbers. Yep. Roger Clemens, not in the Hall of Fame. Joke. Seven Cy Youngs. Alex Rodriguez, not in the Hall of Fame. 700 home runs. You're, what you're, telling, you feel me, what you're point, telling me in a roundabout way, the, uh, the Hall of Fame is t uh, tainted. How can you have a Hall of Fame and not have Roger Clemens or Barry Bonds uh, in the Hall of Fame? What the hell kind yeah, of Hall of Fame? Yeah, it's crazy. The Hall of Fame, what kind of Hall of Fame is it? Is it, is it yeah. the Hall of Good? <laughs> I mean, guys make mistakes. <laughs> the Roger Hall of Clemens good. won That's seven actually... Cy Youngs. <laughs> Barry Bonds yeah, know, had over 750 crazy. home runs. Yep. He didn't take steroids during the whole 750. And why did Roger Clemens get caught? Because Andy Pettit snitched on him? Mm -hmm. Come on. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's good for the Hall of Fame. I don't think it's good for the Hall of Fame. No, I agree. And if you want I to agree. put an asterisk I, by my name, go ahead and put it. Well, well that's what because happened. Because Gamlin, uh, remember... Gamlin did not help me get any of those damn hits. Score any of those this damn is, runs. Win any of those oh, damn games. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, because none of the gambling accusations were done while you were a player. They were done when you were a manager. So, yeah. There we go. Well, in 1999... It's like a, it's like a jockey betting on his horse <laughs> to win the derby. <laughs> right. That's what it's like. <laughs> That's what it's like. I agree. <laughs> Well, in 1999, you were chosen for the MLB All Century Team. So, and they would they would do this to you throughout the years. They would ban you from everything, but then pick you for certain things when they needed the promotion. When they needed this, they they'd be in my corner. Right. Was and, that kind and, of annoying? And they, and they think there's they think that we don't understand that or we don't see that. You know, when you rule against a guy. Every time something financially is in front of them, I guess they don't. Mm -hmm. Well, at that All Century Team game, yeah. Uh, after the game, uh, Jim Gray uh, basically went really hard at you. Yeah. In the yeah. post game, well, first of all, for, first of all, today Jim Gray is a friend of mine. However, mm -hmm. before that game, Jim Gray lied to me. Okay, first of all, this is my first day back at the ballpark. And as you know, I got the biggest ovation. Yep. And Jim said, can I interview you after you're walking off the field? Nothing negative. I won't talk about gambling. Everything he asked me wow. was about gambling. Oh, no, I watched it. He went He went really hard at you. Yeah. An interview so that, I, that, I, I, I that kind of caught me bit. off guard because he just t got through telling me there was going to be nothing negative about it. But I made up with Jim since, and uh, I get along with Jim Gray today. You know, yeah. but he's one of those guys that uh, uh, Jim Controversial Gray is his name. He's got to be in the <laughs> middle of a controversy. Yep. Uh, well, in 2004, you wrote a book, My Prison Without Bars. Yeah. And that was the first time you actually admitted 
to betting on games. What was it about that time that you felt you finally no had idea. to come clean about it? No idea. 19 years ago? Listen, yeah. I can't remember what I did two days ago. <laughs> okay. I really can't. I can't, I can't remember why, why I did a, a book. I mean, I was trying to make money, surviving. Mm -hmm. I mean, by that time, was your money situation bad or were you still a multimillionaire? Well, first of all, I've never been a multimillionaire. Okay, don't forget what no. I played. Don't forget what I played. I didn't play today. If, right. if I played today, I'd be a multimillionaire. Okay. Or if I played five years ago, I'd be a multimillionaire. Right, but you were still a, a huge draw in terms of events and signing autographs and everything else yeah, like but, that. Yeah, but, so but, but back 15, 20 years ago, you didn't make the money uh, at, a, at a signing that you do today. Okay, I get it. You know. It costs more money to visit Santa Claus today than it did 10 years ago. Right. That's just the way it is. And I'm not complaining. Mm -hmm. But I have to work today. I work I work my ass off. But I enjoy it. But why do I enjoy people? I enjoy talking yeah. to people. Well, uh, on September 11, 2010, there was a roast on the 25th anniversary, anniversary of your 4,192nd hit. And, you know, a lot of the, a lot of your team members were there from the big red machine. Where was it? And, um, where was the roast? Where was the roast? Cincinnati? It, it was, uh, in Indiana. Don't remember it. Right. Don't remember it. Well, well, at that point, according to reports, it said that you cried and, you know, you, you basically cried to the rest of the team and said, I'm sorry for disrespecting baseball. And you said, I guarantee everyone in this room, I'll never dis disrespect you again. I love the fans. I love the game of baseball. And I love Cincinnati baseball. I, I, I don't remember that. I don't remember okay. that. It might have happened. I don't remember it. I've only cried a couple of times oh. in my life. Okay. Well, um, in 2016, you filed a defamation lawsuit against John M. Dowd, the lawyer that, uh, that did the report on you. And initially. I don't remember that either. So okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to answer any questions about any lawsuit because I don't remember doing it. Sorry about that. I just okay. don't remember. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, final question before I let you go. These days, cancel culture is a very popular thing, especially with social media. You were one of the first people in sports to get canceled. How do you feel about cancel culture and your role in it? I got canceled? In a way. What do you mean? Well, I mean, based on the whole gambling situation, you end up losing, you know, your job with the Cincinnati Reds and you got excluded from the Hall of Fame. Certain thing, you know, your job got well, canceled. Yeah, you're, and talking, your you're talking about the hundred million I told you about. And the hundred million also. You know, when you look at cancel culture these days, what's your thoughts on it? Um, well, I'm not understanding the question. Okay. Cancel culture. I don't understand what you're saying. Okay. Basically what I'm saying is this. There's a lot of situations that happen in your career and in your life. Everyone makes mistakes. Okay. I've made lots of mistakes. You've well, made I mistakes. I thought I was the only one who made mistakes. <laughs> right. That's the way I've been treated. <laughs> right. So. In most cases, people make mistakes and, you know, people look at the big picture and say, okay, although this mistake was made, look at all the other things this person has accomplished. So we're going to give this person a pass. We're going to, we're going to let this go and we're going to allow this person to proceed with their life. But when the media is involved, when social media is involved, especially when fans are involved and so forth, a lot of times people get forever punishment, which is what happened in your case. And what happens in a lot of people's cases? You know, people don't want to forgive. People don't want to say, let's look at the big picture and let's forgive well, this person. You're they right, say, no, this person still, should be canceled there's forever. There's still people today that, that say, I don't belong in the Hall of Fame. Okay. Why? Where did I lack? Yeah, I'm not one of them. Because the Hall of Fame. I, I think you absolutely is, belong in the Hall of Fame. The Hall of Fame, fame is statistics, mm -hmm. right? And nobody's got better statistics than me. I don't think. Maybe I'm. Maybe I'm wrong. But uh, no, you're definitely not wrong. 
So, but what you're going to do? I mean, you can't make everybody like you because there's people who don't like the way I talk. They don't like the way I walk. But they all had to love the way I played because one thing I always played with, trying to give the people who paid their money's worth. I never cheated a fan in my life. And I played in 3,500 goddamn games. How many players can say that? I can say None. it. I can say it because it's the truth. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to persuade people right now to like me, okay? I'm just trying to persuade people that I have not been given a second chance. Who do you know that has not been given a second chance? People will say, well, uh, somebody, somebody. Yeah, you're one of the few. You're, you're definitely one of the few. And I'm still, I'm still out there. You understand what I'm saying? I'm still mm -hmm. doing card shows two or three times a month. I'm still associating with the fans. I'm still picking up babies and getting my picture taken and doing events for handicapped people and stuff like that. I'm the one that's out there doing that. A lot of players today don't do that. Why? Because they don't need to. They all got millions in the bank. If I had millions in the bank, you think I'd be sitting here talking to you right now? I wouldn't. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. And you're a good guy. Fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. You asshole. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, man. I, I've been called worse before. I've been called worse. Well, Pete Rose, regardless of a Hall of Fame or not, the stats speak for themselves. You're an absolute legend in this game. And you have records that I don't know will ever be beaten just because the game is different. Just because people don't play as hard. People get injured more often. They don't play as long. Uh, the, the, the rules, the rules are, are just I, not the same as they were during that time. What you're saying in a roundabout way is I have a lot of longevity records. And yes. longevity is not the strong point for baseball today for players. Hmm. Because they can't afford to pay what they're paying these guys for 20 years. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You make it 20 million a year. How are you going to pay a guy for 20 years? That's 400 million. Oh, and oh if, yeah. they, if they <laughs> sign a 10 year contract for 500 million, that's 10 years. You're not going to get 4,000 hits in 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. But don't I, forget, I that, don't forget one thing that I did. And it's my best record. And I have like 26, 28 major league records. I won more games than anybody in the professional ranks ever. Correct. That's the best record I have. Winning games. 1,972. Mm. That's 250 more than a guy second. Who's a guy named Carl Yaskrimski. Who was a pretty good player. Mm -hmm. until somebody beats that record, I don't want to hear about them. I, I don't, I don't want to hear about them because I, I know, I, no, I know nobody's going to get that many hits. And I, I, yeah, would think I mean, no a 24 season runs, career, huh? I, I mean, a 24 season career. Has that been done in, in, in any sport? Playing 24? Ty yeah, Cobb 24 tw I mean, I guess maybe in golf, you could play golf for 24 years. Ty Cobb played 24 years. Okay. But don't forget how to, many uh, how many how many of those are there though? Not many. Uh, yeah. The old days they played more. But there again, uh, when you play twenty four years, you didn't play a lot your twenty fourth year. Mm -hmm. You know, just just take thirty five hundred and fifty and divide it by twenty four, and you see how many games I played a year. Now I actually looked it up. Nolan Ryan played twenty seven seasons. He's a pitcher, so yeah, a little different, and a good one. Exactly. Struck me out but twenty-two. Did, he struck me out twenty-two times. <laughs> Nolan Ryan struck me out twenty-two times, and he walked me twenty-eight times. And I hit two ninety two ninety-four off of him, mm. which is not bad off Nolan Ryan. I hit three hundred seven yeah. off Bob Gibson. 
Mm. Okay. I hit I hit almost 500 off of Warren Spawn. I got 64 hits off Phil Necro, and I got 30 oh. some hits off his brother Joe. That's the fortieth of all my hits off the Necro family. If she'd have had five boys, I'd have got five thousand hits. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well, Pete Rose, man, I appreciate you coming in and telling your story. It's a phenomenal story. Uh, it's a story that can't be retold. And you know, regardless of any Hall of Fame, anything, uh, your stats are phenomenal. And Charlie Hustle truly describes who you are, not only why you're playing, but now, you know, to this day, you're still hustling. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And you're 80 years old now? 81. 81 years old, and you're still hustling. So whoever gave you that name Mickey. didn't realize. Mickey Mantle. No, no, I understand. What I'm saying is when Mickey Mantle gave you that name, I don't think he realized how long this name is going to carry. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah. 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 This wasn't a nickname that just, you know, lasted a year or two. Right. This is a nickname that has lasted your whole life, and you truly earned that nickname. Thank you. So, Pete Rose, I appreciate you Thank coming Thank you for your questions. You did your homework, and uh, you didn't offend me at all. Okay. Maybe once or twice. Okay. <laughs> That's what it is. Until next time. Peace.